Well, greetings. Well, hello. You would think I don't have any cereal, but I do. Mm. Mm. But we're fresh out of raw milk. We are. I need to go get more. Um, by the way, um, most of the time I've been eating during these videos, um, that's actually a, kind of a public act. <laughs> you know, so the public act of eating of eating. on video. I mean, you see it. You see it in movies all the time, right? There are cooking shows, which cooking shows are my favorite. By the way, if we had TV. We have at cable. I would be watching um, the Food Network. But more importantly, I'm gonna about all that. Jesus, when he taught, always was at dinner with someone, right? He dined with Cheers. his disciples with his friends so i don't think there's anything wrong with that so i hope no one gets offended by this because <coughs> yeah. i love my cereal that was subtle he also goes way out of his way after the resurrection to like eat stuff yeah like come have breakfast <laughs> yeah. breakfast or goes like, up to them is like do you have anything to eat my little children yeah to yeah. show that we're corporeal and some i don't know some people think that we're just like these phantasm ghost things yeah. of Jesus. So maybe you're just trying to show your corporeality uh -huh. to your parish by exactly. eating. Right. I tell people all the time, you know, remember, take care of your bodies because the Lord created both. The soul and the body, the spirit and the body as well. So we can't just take care of one. Uh, it's both. And, uh, you know, the highest point to me when it comes to food is that he chose to stay to remain with us in the form of food, I dare to say. So it, it's, I don't know, there's just something about it. And just be grateful that your pastor is not eating Wendy's and Nutter Butters because plenty <sighs> of pastors do that. <laughs> and <laughs> mm. they become very shapely. Yeah, yeah. Then they have to go to confession. Which? Hey, speaking of. Speaking of confession, let's talk about confession today. Um, I know we have preached about it a few times in the past in the parish. However, um, yeah, like the first six months. <laughs> At least yes. I made subtle references to it the first six months of us being here. And thanks to that, we have a good number of people coming to confession. Penitents. Uh, right. Um, I always say that's a good problem to have. Mm -hmm. There are many parishes that have confessions and one or two people show up. And that's a very sad thing for the or pastor. Or worse, the church has 4 to 4.15 or by appointment. Oh, yes. Yes. So, But that's a different catechesis. Right. Um, but, you know, it, uh, it kind of puts me at, uh, in an uneasiness um, when people don't go to confession the proper way um, and and then sometimes they don't know what's a good confession what uh, the elements are uh, needed to make a good confession etc and so um, first I, I want to talk about the matter of confession which is the sins that the people bring to the confessional mm -hmm. I want to talk about this first because I have had in my 50 years, 15 years of priesthood about, I'd say about a good 10 people that have come to me and don't tell me one sin. And some of them have talked to me for like up to 10 minutes and I start being patient. After the sixth, seventh minute, I become impatient and then I ask for sins and they can't give me any sins, you know. I'm good, Father. I don't do bad things. I don't, and then uh, I, I'm I'm in a bad situation where I'm like, okay, I cannot give this person a absolution. And then some people even get offended because of this, and and so it is just a very difficult situation. Um, so in order for someone to go to confession, they must tell me their sins. Which most people are going to be like, well, duh. But to extrapolate <laughs> slightly more, they'll come in and say, well, Father, you know, uh, the world is just in such a bad state, or 
um, my mom's having to leave her apartment and I'm just having to help her do this stuff and and you get kind of factoid after factoid after factoid which has different levels of emotion tied to it in that penitent's head and you're like just tell me a sin right I mean yes my child <laughs> just tell, just me, tell a me a sin um, and uh, you know sometimes we confess this way um, you know uh, a word, a bad word just came out of my mind or, you know, things like that as if things just happened to me that are sins. No, I committed this sin. I did this. I have to take responsibility for the sin and I have to actually tell the priest the sin, the bad things that I did. And and sometimes really it's, it's really difficult, but um, what we need to do to go to confession is you know, if you don't know what you have done, go through the Ten Commandments and to the seven deadly sins um, or capital sins and, and, and see if you have committed any of those. Um, and, and go a little deeper than, for example, have I killed? And if the answer is no, well, then go a little deeper. Um, have I killed someone's reputation? By talking behind their backs, Gossip, slander, or, libel. You know, so so it, it's I just it's just so important. On our part, then the uh, form. What happens, Father, if someone comes, tells me their sins, and I say, "Okay, see you later. You're forgiven." Yeah. Is that valid? Toodaloo. Yeah. No. So one of the things Father's getting at is every sacrament has what's called form and matter. Something physical and then um, and then the prayer that's to be said over it. So that would be the form. So the matter is not only the sins, but the sins confessed. To be like slightly nuanced in that. Because if you know that you like murdered someone and you're like, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I like cheated on my taxes. And I got angry at a fellow driver. For these and all my sins, I'm truly sorry. And they like nestle one in the all my sins category. That ain't no sin confessed. That ain't no sin confessed and therefore is not a valid confession. Right? If I don't tell my sins because I if don't want to. If someone intentionally withheld a mortal right. sin. Absolutely. What if I forget a sin? If you forget a sin, um, then make the determination if it's mortal or not. If it's mortal, bring it up in your next confession. Um, and maybe bump up your frequency of confession at that point. Um, but also just trust in the fact that one, God's merciful. Two, you did not choose to withhold a sin. Um, and so it's not, you know. It is a valid confession. Yeah. Right? Even if I forgot one. But if I don't say it because I didn't want to, for whatever reason, then it's not a valid confession. So you brought up form, the form of the confession. Um, mm -hmm. In its most essential act is ego te absolvo in nomine patris et fili, and the rest of it, right? I absolve you of your sins in the Trinitarian formula, right? But then there's what's called the integrity of the sacrament, which is everything else, right? And so that would be the starting of the prayer of absolution, God the Father of mercies, who the death and resurrection, that whole paragraph. But also, for an even more intact uh, integrity of the sacrament, it's beginning in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the penitent saying, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And so, uh, so many times, I'm probably beating you to the punchline here, someone's on the other side of the screen, or th and they're just like, yes. they're like what, do I, what do I do? I once had somebody, I was just kind of praying my breviary, and the person had come into the confessional and didn't close the door and was had been kneeling there like super silently yep. for like five minutes. And I was just like praying my ruby because I was like, nobody's there. And then she's like, can I start now? And I like, I <laughs> oh. jumped because I didn't know anyone <laughs> was there. And, and so it really is the penitent, um, the person who's coming to confession, it's on them to say, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Most people don't do that, so I think we initiate for them. However, because especially in this parish that is a bilingual parish, I ask, but I usually ask just my Spanish speakers, but it's for everyone. 
that you start on, you know, uh, in English or in Spanish, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, or en el nombre del Padre, del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo, without waiting for us for that reason. Once you say that, then I know. I know whether I'm going to uh, start in English or in Spanish. Because in Spanish, right after they say that, I say something, which is Ave Maria Purissima, and they respond, Sin pecado concebida. But let's go to the English, because also I, I, I think it's important that the, the right words come out of their mouths, as the church has taught us in English to go to confession, which um, right after the, the sign of the cross, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, they are supposed to say not just, well, Father, these are my sins. No. It's a complete uh, formula, so to speak. It's not mandatory or does not affect the validity of the sacrament, but that's how we've been taught uh, by the church, told by the church to go to confession, and I think it's important. Um, so the words are exactly like this. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been 80 years since my last confession, and these are my sins. As I was meditating upon that, you know, when, I, when, when they say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned, think of this. At the end, when we give the absolution, you know, we end in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, as we bless them. So that's the blessing that they are getting at the end, which they ask for at the beginning, you know, and that's why they say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Um, so, so, so it's a formula, if you will, but there is significance to it. The church doesn't do just, just doesn't do things just, just to have something to do. It's so right? I love those words as well because, right? Blessing, Latin benedicere, to speak something good, yes. right? And so literally, what they're saying is, <laughs> speak something to me, good Father, for I have done something bad. Right? Yes. Which like totally opens up the heart of mercy of Jesus, where when the penitent comes and says, bless me, Father, for I have sinned, not like castigate me, Father, which is an SAT word for punishing or whatever, right? Or, you know, have mercy on me, I, I stink or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's a confidence that a penitent has to come to the priest and say, give me something good. Bless me. For I have sinned. I have fallen short of the mark. I have missed the mark, would be the old Hebrew understanding of hamartia, of sin. Um, and so just to begin with the formula, bless me, Father, for I have sinned, shows the utter confidence of the penitent to seek the, the good things of Jesus even when we don't deserve them. Correct. I think that's beautiful. Tell me then, you know, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. As you said, you know, they're going to tell you some bad words. I mean, meaning the sins that they've committed. And then you're going to give them some good words to cancel all of those words. That's, by the way, that's what the sacrament is about. It's not to make people nervous, not to give them penances of a hundred push-ups, nothing difficult. Have you ever done that? Have you ever given push-ups as a penance? I am not going to answer <laughs> that. I cannot wow. confirm nor deny. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but, however, um, which, by the way, penance. I've also had cases where once I give the penance, the response is, oh, yeah, well, I'll do that. I do that every day. Or, Father, give me a bigger penance. Penance is what the priest gives you. It's not paying, repaying for the sins that you have committed. And many people have that mentality. If I get a bigger penance, then I'm paying more for the sins that, I, that I've committed. The Lord already paid for your sins. Penance is an act of recognizing. You, you do something so as to recognize how repentant you are, you know, of, of, of your sins. It's not that you actually are repaying for the sins, for that debt that you have fallen into because of your sins. So, yeah, just do what the priest tells you to do, please. Um, Good. Okay. So, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been X amount of time since my last confession. These are my sins, which is setting you up 
to say sins, not stories, not circumstances, yes. not the world's problems, not something you saw on CNN. You know, many times people come and say, I know you don't like stories, but, and then they launch into this long story. But yes, preferably, please, no stories, just your sins. Like, I can say, Father, I have killed four times. I have stolen cereal three times. I have slapped Father Daniel around one time. You know, things like that. That's how you confess, um, not, not the whole story. Um, also, just really quick, uh, when I was going to catechism, I know that was a long time ago. Watch it, people. Um, but I learned, you know, they told me there are five necessary things, you know, for a good confession. Um, really quick, examination of conscience, which many people don't do. They come, and even if they have, you know, I haven't been to confession in 20 years, they don't do a good examination of conscience, and that's when we fall into problems most of the time. If we haven't thought about our sins, if we don't know what we're bringing to confession, then we're stuck in the confessional, and then many times when, they, when I hear, Father, help me, you know, and then I'm like, well, I am sorry, I, I haven't been with you when you have committed anything, so just tell me the bad things that you have done. But if they do an examination of conscience previously, then they are ready, right? So examination of conscience, uh, to be sorry for your sins, uh, to tell your sins to the priest, uh, to do your penance, and what's the other one? I'm missing one. Contrition? Yes. Oh, no, you said sorry, being sorry. Yeah. Uh, examination of conscience, sorrow for your sins, uh, to tell your sins to the priest, uh, examine, examine the conciencia, dolor de los pecados, propósito. Oh! Um, purpose of amendment. Purpose of amendment. Mm. If I'm going to sin, but I have an appointment with my ex-girlfriend <laughs> to go to, you know, to go do bad things with her tonight, am I really, you know, uh, have I decided not to sin again? No. Yeah. So. Now, what would be the difference between something that's habitual sin, something that I've struggled with for a long time, where, in all likelihood, I know that it'll happen again sometime in the next that year. That it might happen, yeah. Mm -hmm. Versus, but I'm like really sorry and I want to change my life. Versus, like, uh, let me just like, I have a plan. I'll like say it to Father in case I get hit by a bus and then, you know, whatever. Right. No, there's a, there's a big difference because the Lord wants you to get up. However many times you have fallen into the same sin or different sins, just get up, repent, truly repent, and go to confession. Um, and don't give up. Many people tend to give up as an, okay, I've been committing this sin since I was 13, 14, 15. I am now 80 years old. It's never going to change. No, do not think that. Just repent for your, from your sin, repent of your sin, come to confession, and leave the rest to the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, again, it doesn't matter how many times you have fallen, so long as you keep getting up. But it does matter if I say, well, you know, I'm going to confession, uh, I'm going to do it anyway later on again. That's a whole different thing. Right? Because nice. then I have, on that one, I have the intention to sin again. Um, please memorize an act of contrition. Um, and, you know, some people say, well, I know the old one. And then they start and then they don't know the old one, you know. Uh, or, and, and I know in many parishes, including this one, they were used to a little paper that someone would g give them so that they could read it. It is important for us to memorize the act of contrition, not only because of the mental exercise, but because if we internalize it, then the words would become part of us repentant sinners. We're supposed to know it. Now, there are about seven or eight acts of, contrition's, uh, acts of contrition out there, whichever one you know, as long as you know that one, <laughs> as long as you know one. 
I have a parishioner. There's a parishioner here who is a poet. She wrote a beautiful act of contrition. I'm actually going to print it or put it in the bulletin so that some people that don't know it can learn that one because I just find it so stinking beautiful. I love it. I think there's another really good reason to know an, know an act of contrition. Um, during this time of COVID, there's been certain institutions that have not let priests in. And they're and, right. and <coughs> including Catholic hospital networks run by Shame on you, Catholic run hospital by networks. liberal uninhabited nuns. Yep. And they have denied the entrance of priests in and they say, "Oh, Father, that's okay. We sprinkle holy water on our iPhones when we do FaceTime." <coughs> Yeah, and we rent our garments Ugh. and cry out to heaven. Um, and so, and so, at the end of somebody's life, if they are unable to have access to a priest for whatever reason, let's say, let's say the best case scenario, they actually call, cry out for a priest, whatever, and somewhere along the way, the message doesn't make it to a priest or something like that. Mm -hmm. Right? They should make their um, do an examination of conscience, right? Do the re the whole formula of confession without a priest, um, to God, right in the silence of their hearts, and then with as much contrition, with as much sorrow for their sins, uh, as they can muster, say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Living God, have mercy on me, a sinner, right? Or whatever the act of contrition that they're going to use is, right? Yeah. Now that's only in the absence of a priest, yes. right? Where a priest cannot be reached. But unfortunately, that's been kind of the case over these past few months um, yeah. of, of people not having access to priests in the same way. And so to, to have someone who's really well acquainted with the formula, with the form of confession, um, in the absence of a priest, it would be the thing to go to to just have confidence in, in the mercy and salvation offered by Jesus. Right. So what we would call perfect contrition, right? Try to be as contrite, as perfectly contrite as you can within uh, what you just explained. Um, I don't want to uh, get into Protestant versus Catholic and confession. However, just to remind you, Catholics, um, it is scriptural that the Lord instituted the sacrament, that the Lord said, whose sins you forgive will be forgiven whose sins you retain will be retained. So he never said, confess your sins to me and I will hear you up in heaven. No, we ought to go to confession. And um, just so you know, your priests here go to confession. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard because people might think, well, I don't think my priests ever go to confession. Why should I? We do go to confession. That one's every two or three weeks. Same here, every two weeks. So. And the funny thing is, we can't go anonymously. We have to call up a priest we know. And yeah. So if we have a big one in our hearts. <laughs> we'd be like, uh, hey, can you hear my confession? Can I go? <laughs> um, I have a standing, uh, well, not standing, but every two weeks, uh, my confessor and I get together. I like to go to the same confessor so that I don't go around, you know, hiding sins here and there. It's because like squirrels and acorns. Uh, there you, you go. You bury one over there, or you bury hey. one over there, and then all the priests think that you're holy because that one only thinks you lie, that one only thinks you lust, that one only thinks that you're greedy, whatever. Which means what he was really talking about unconsciously is to, like, our parishioners who don't like to go to us, they go to other parishes, uh, because they think we're going to think less of them. <laughs> I don't like that. For this reason, I don't like to send my work to other priests. But remember this. When you come to confession to us and we see you again afterwards, we don't think of the sin. We think of the grace that you received. You know, if you come and say, Father, I robbed the bank, you know, in confession. Instead of when I see you thinking, well, there's the bank robber. I think of someone that is not a bank robber and therefore 
that person could not live without with that sin in their soul and that's why they came to confession mm -hmm. just so you know we don't think i promise you we don't think less of you whatever the sin it is that you come to confess to us not to mention we hear dozens of confessions a week and Besides sin that? is generic and most people like are really fixated on their sins uh, yeah. and I think sin is like the most boring part of confession it's the like it's the repentance of heart the the um, dolor de pecado how did you put it? the, the sorrow for your the sins the sorrow for your sins um, that is like supremely beautiful yes absolutely um, I used to say you know whatever you're going to tell me I've done it I've seen it <laughs> or I've heard it in confession <laughs> But emphasis on, I've heard it in confession, okay? So, because some people have some stuff that they think, oh, Father has done this. No, it's one of the three. Either I've done it, I've seen it done, or I have heard it in confession. 99% of them, I've heard in confession. So, there you go. How about... You mentioned, there. you mentioned oh. scrupulosity. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so there are um, a few people that may fall into what we call scrupulosity, meaning everything is a sin. Every little thing is a sin. And though scrupulosity is a problem because they either see sin where there is not or they make their sin you know much much bigger um, still sometimes I, I'm truly I prefer that to the opposite of it when you know people haven't been to confession for 15 years ah, father it's not like I killed anybody or anything exactly like that. exactly and there's like you know I just have little sins and I always give the example and I wanna I wanna wear a white shirt and then get a little bit of mud uh, watery mud throw it on my shirt over and over and over again see all those little stains how it turns my white shirt into a very 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 dirty shirt um, so um, I'm not justifying scrupulosity um, so come and see the priest and follow the instructions of the priest uh, as much as possible but please do not ever fall on the other side, at the other extreme. Extremes are always, you know, to be avoided. So, so yeah, scrupulosity is related to despair, right? A despair that, that I can't be forgiven or that I'm so entrenched in my sin uh, that I can't be extricated can't by out. the Lord. Not even the Lord can save me, right? On the other side, so hope is in the middle. Hope is the theological virtue that somebody needs to go to confession. If you go to confession, you hope that the Lord will grant the forgiveness that you seek. You have despair, which would be in scrupulosity. That needs to be teased out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Then you have presumption. Ooh. And presumption is a couple of things. It's, it's, it can be, take the form of universalism, right? Oh, everyone's going to be saved anyways. The Lord died once and for all for everybody. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what my the the orientation of my will, right? Me trying to live a moral life doesn't really matter because like Jesus already paid the price, right? Once saved, always saved, right? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a certain level of presumption, right? That uh, plenty of Protestants espouse. But then there's like subtle nuances in the Catholic world, right? Even people who are really well formed and go to confession. Let's say they fall to a certain mortal sin of any kind. And they're like, well, I'm going to confession on Saturday. I might as well get one or two more in. Oh, yeah. And then Father will forgive me anyways, right? Yeah. And that's a deep abuse of a relationship, right? Um, so you have something that started out in a sin of weakness most of the time. And then there's a compounding sin of presumption whereby the person, the sinner, is is defining his relationship with God. God, since you're this celestial bean counter, and since you're going to wipe my ledger clean, let me just rack up a few more debts on this side, and then you'll just kind of expunge it all. 
And that begin, begins to change the orientation of the heart away from a humble dependence on Jesus, even in the midst of sin, to an entitled entitlement <laughs> manipulation, which much more resembles that of Satan than any sin of weakness, any sin of the flesh, any sin of anything else um, that might have been the original starting point or struggle. And so hope, presumption, despair, right? We're always trying to move to Christian hope that when I approach humbly the sacrament of confession, that the Lord will meet me with love and mercy. I think the last thing that I would add to this whole conversation is I love teaching theology of the body. I love teaching it to middle schoolers and high schoolers. And one of the things I always say is sin is a choice. Because once you start talking about like things of the body, especially the kids going through puberty or whatever, then they're like, yeah. oh, is thinking Susie Q at the other side of English <laughs> class that she's cute, is that a sin? Absolutely not, kids, by the way. Yeah. Sin is a choice. And so, right, you have human will. Humans have intellect, passions, and will. Intellect, an ability to apprehend the world around them. Passions, which would be emotions, right? Any feeling or emotion is never a sin by itself, not even that of anger. Anger is a God-given drive towards justice and restoration in the face of something evil. Now you can take that anger and use it towards something destructive, that would be the capital sin of wrath. But there is no feeling that by itself is a sin. So a lot of people come into confession and say, Father, I was just really frustrated at this person, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes there might be a sin there. You need to tease it out. But I, that's generally a sign of the person either being poorly catechized, right, not enlightening their intellect by way of intellectual formation around the sacrament, um, or just a certain laziness, right? They're not diving into what what's bothering me about this person, this circumstance, and am I playing into it in a sinful way? Because, right, sin is a choice. So intellect, passions, or emotions, and then will. Sin only resides on the level of the will, what you choose, right? And so you can choose things that are bad. Those are sins, so it's missing the mark. The really cool thing is you have to choose to go to confession. You have to choose to say your sins out loud. And so even though you're like super nervous, even though you're whatever, you may not know everything. You may not know all of your sins. You may not know exactly how many times you've done it, especially if it's been over a year since confession. It takes your will to undo what your will first did. And so confession meets the penitent right at the same point of pain in their choices. That's beautiful. That's, uh, think, uh, uh, this is the way <laughs> it came to me. I, I, I love it, Father. Thank you. Um, St. Thomas th says that the two greatest things we have as human beings, what makes us human? you know, the intellect and the will. So you put it so well, the emotions and the passions will come to you in whatever way. But think of this, you have your intellect and you know, so that you can find out, okay, what is that about? What is that doing to me? You know, go deep into it and, and, and learn more, more about it. But then you also have the free will. So use those things and the free will will say, no, I'm not going to act upon it because it's not good for me. It might be, you know, it might give you, give me a moment of pleasure, but is it good for me? Absolutely not. Is it good for my soul, for my eternal life? Absolutely not. So use your intellect and your will to control your passions and your emotions. You can. You can do it. Only you can prevent mortal sin in your life. Oh, yes. Okay. We'll be back. Ciao.